If James finds himself in a location where someone has died, his powers act like a sponge, and he picks something up. What that is, I cannot exactly name. The media and most of religions call it soul. The government has declared it residual life essence, while the professor simply said it was fucking weird. The only time I've ever heard him use that term. Wherever it is, when he picks it up, he gets the person's memories, their abilities, and often will start to resemble that person. What I mean by that is if the person was big and black, James would get bigger, maybe not as big, and he would get darker, but by no means black. He had no control of the physical changes, but he did have control of the memories and the powers for a time. If he only got the memories, his powers would still be phenomenal. Imagine a man who could find out where a loved one left the will, or how many unfinished works of art that could be completed. But with the powers, James had potential to be one of the greatest. And like with most of the great ones, his power also comes at a cost. Karma may or may not be real, but James makes a good case that it exists. After having control of a person's powers and memories, James will then spend about time under control of the deceased. The length of the control they had was dependent on how strong the person's will had been during life. Most of the time was short and the payment required was not terrible. A hero telling his wife the goodbye that he never had a chance to. A villain spending hours trying to atone for a life that they now saw as wasted. But there were times when the cost was much worse. I remember one time while drunk and on a dare, James had been convinced to take on Douglas MacArthur. It had been a fun bet, and James spent hours telling secrets of the once great general. But then the bastard took over, and did not leave for three weeks. Afterwards, James had been worn out, and for a while he was considering giving up the business. From a few conversations with him, I have found that while MacArthur had been bad, it was bearable. What really scared him was that one day he would take on someone who had enough willpower or personal strength to take over forever, leaving James as a helpless observer in his own body. It was for this reason that James had eschewed many of the names the media had given. The government PR flunkies had tried to assign him some. He had turned them down. James said he was always himself, and he never wanted to hide that as long as he had control. Every introduction, he always said the same thing. I'm James. Just James. Now, his ability and the consequences were pretty much easy to follow, when there was only one person for him to latch onto. However, if the scene of death was where multiple people died, the results sometimes became unpredictable. Take two strong men, James might take them both and find that he is strong as both of them combined. Or he might find that something in the power set of one interfered with the power set of another and that their powers were a complete wash and he have to repress one while using the other. Usually, the time he got to borrow all the powers extended with each deceased person he absorbed at a time. But there have been times when this wasn't always true. The one thing that was always consistent was the aftermath. Once the powers were gone and he started to lose control, he would rapidly switch from person to person, each person fighting to be the dominant. It was a bit unnerving to watch. Fighting force had consisted of five active heroes. Cricket, of whom I have said enough of, C-O-M-P, Comp, a self-aware robot who in many ways was more human than most. He had been created by some mad scientist who had somehow had one stroke of genius in a life of bad mistakes. His powers were the ability to fly, a computer level of intellect, and a C-class strength. Wall, a large physically imposing man who made most feel small. Eight feet tall and five feet wide, and his skin thicker than a brick. His strength was not much more than an average bodybuilder, but he had the ability to pretty much take any kind of punishment. I have many memories of him planting his feet and standing straight in harm's way to protect his teammates and civilians. Not once have I heard of someone who was able to make him move. Slipster, a B-plus class speedster. He had the ability to fly, but spent most of the time on the ground. He was fast, but never hesitated to slow down and help someone. Jackhammer, a simple-minded man who had no business in being a superhero, but the law was the law, and he wanted to be like the people he grew up admiring. His fist could reduce boulders to gravel in a matter of moments, yet he was more known for the times he didn't use them. On his off hours, he would often fly with the birds who were never too afraid to reach on him. 
two years ago they had been at their headquarters relaxing after an off-world mission. It was 5 or 5 p.m. and the building was on quarantine, lockdown. It had been so for seven hours and was scheduled to last another week. A week-long quarantine was the standard practice for those who had visited an unregistered planet. At 5.06 p.m. they left the world again as atomic dust courtesy of the chipmunk. A team who had broken so many barriers and who the world owed so much to was destroyed by a Z-class villain who had a grudge against the cricket. The chipmunk was a killer, but he was actually too old, Dr. Stefan. If yesterday was to be born for Nazi's death, it would also be remembered as the day that Dr. Stefan was finally defeated. For the last five years, he had been on the top of every government's watch list and a target wanted by every hero. Intelligence off the charts with no moral compunction. He had made himself the prime enemy of the only hero he had thought worth his time, Superstar. They had fought often over the years. Sometimes it was Dr. Stefan who pulled the win, sometimes Superstar, but neither of them getting a full win. Dr. Stefan was never in jail, and Superstar kept on breathing, but the world never knew which way he would go. Yet, their battles only took a part of Dr. Stefan's attention. He was a multitasker and knew how to run multiple plans at once in ways that would all overlap and intertwine. When he was not going up toe-to-toe -to -toe with Superstar, he or one of his many groups were giving different teams trouble. I lost count of the number of times when I thought I finally tracked him down, only to find that I was not just hours behind him, but sometimes days or weeks. Still, I had become somewhat of an expert on him, if anyone could be called that. It was during one of my unsuccessful attempts that I found the reason he had given the chipmunk a portable nuke launcher. It is a secret I will not ever let out in public. Superstar had been out on an off-world mission of his own for a week, and Stefan had gotten bored. He provided Chipmunk with a bomb because he knew that only Chipmunk would be done enough to actually use it in the middle of New York. It had been one of the miniature nukes. All the destructive power of a regular nuclear bomb, but for yield contained within a 2,000-foot cubed area. James slumped in his chair for a moment then sat straight up rigid. All emotions fled from his face, and I could swear the flakes of metal started to form. His voice turned electronic, and his voice cord struggled to handle a tone no human was ever meant to use. Attention, attention. External sensors had detected an incoming Y-757 Type B nuclear weapon. Triple calculations verify that we are target, and the impact will be in one minute. Authorities have been notified an emergency quarantine lift has been requested. Estimated time till remote release of locks, 4.759 minutes. Scans have revealed the closest resource, the black laser, capable of stopping a Y-757 Type B nuclear weapon is 7.75 minutes away. List of options. Option A, self-preservation. Upload of a personality and offsite backup. Self-preservation overridden. To leave without saving this unit's friends, unacceptable. Option B, access Y-757 nuclear weapon Wi-Fi network and disarm. Rejection. Port is closed. Option C, lift quarantine procedures. Rejected. Would take 7.99999999999 minutes. Option D, go back to option A. Rejected. No time. Option E. Proceed with human tradition called goodbye. Accepted. Goodbye, friends. 40 seconds remaining. Okay, we all know that Comp won the court case allowed him to be considered as a legal person. I was a witness, and it is a proud moment in my memory when the ruling established was now called the Asimov Test for Robot Sentience. He was a human to me, alive and a friend, but I was surprised as anyone else in the bar that there had been a soul a comp to be around for James to capture. Instantly, James lost his rigid stance and his useless fangs returned. There was a drunken stupor in his eyes, and he said, What's this silly, stupid robot saying? Cricket never learned that the yes sound was not his friend. James bulked up, growing four times his normal size. Vertical and horizontal lines formed in his trademark brick fashion that gave Wall his name. Our friend has informed us that in 22 seconds we will be departing this earth. 
I imagine you have qualified that even my resistant body will not survive comp. Affirmative. Friend. Well, I guess that's all there is to it. Cheers, and to the next plane of existence, friends. James slash Walt took a swig of the bottle in front of him. His fist grew large, and the bottle crumbled to dust. I punch out! I punch hard! Without waiting for an answer, James smashed his fists into the bar. The wood of the bar pulverized and shattered, and around the room, various supers reacted with quick reflexes to stop and block the shrapnel it created. I grunted and then ignored the splinter that was embedded in my side. Besides the bar, Fred stood stoically without flinching as wood fizzled against his personal force field. The ally under the bar was untouched, but I knew it would not stand long up to the slow, unyielding punches of jackhammer. I considered my options but relaxed as Jane's fist slimmed down and he grew thin. He grew painfully thin, but I could see under the skin of his legs and arms muscles that grew and twitched faster than my eyes could track. No, my love. Not this time. Come here. Slepter turned around the bar, not seeing me, small and female, but seeing his gay lover. With slowness and tenderness, I could not believe it's possible to someone who contained lightning-fueled muscles. He reached out and hugged me, resting his head on my shoulder. I put my small hand around his back, knowing he was filling those large fists that could break anything but only touch Slipster in love. This lasted a moment. I looked around and saw that conservative, a hero known for his straight values and tough stand on some homosexuality, had tears in his eyes. The moment broke and the cricket returned. No! I will not end like this! I heard a crack of James' legs as another pair of kneecaps formed, and I felt his legs tense. The stupid idiot, he hadn't. But I knew it was quite possible. I quickly pushed James off the stool and away from the bar as his legs shut out. They missed connecting by the bar by about an inch. Sniffless returned to his body. I add to the logs that Cricket died of a fractured neck resulting from impact with the ceiling after trying to jump to safety. Inside. What will death be like, I bond? James just grew quiet, his head slumping. Eyes closed as he slowly morphed back to his normal form. A five foot eight inches white male with no distinguishing marks or features. Lines faded, muscles twitched and spasmed before slowing down. Gray metal dissipated and his legs cracked one more time. There did not seem to be a dominant personality this time. It looked like James would be lucky and he'd wake up in a few minutes with the memories but nothing else. Then he started to change some. The hair, which had already grown, fallen out, and grown again before turning back to normal, started to grow even longer. His sharp male nose softened while his Adam's apple disappeared. He lost an inch of height. I could feel other changes pressing in against me while I was watching his face. As soon as her lips appeared, I turned away. At the time of the rapid departure from life, there had been five active members of the team. They were great people, and I was friends with all of them. Still, they were not the reason Hulohan had sent me over to help with James. He had sent me over because he knew of my personal connection with his sixth member. One I struggled for the last ten minutes to keep out of my mind. My lover, Lotus. Lotus had been assumed to be an untouchable immortal. Bullet, explosive, gasp, sickness, and time flowed off her shapely shoulders, leaving not a mark or wrinkle. However, in this off-world mission, she had met some force beyond imagining that had touched her hard. The team left with six able-bodied members and returned with five and a vegetable. In the headquarters, she had been inside a cryo tube waiting for quarantine to end and receive any treatments that the professor and his team could come up to fix her with. She opened her eyes and I realized that this form of James was no longer James. This change had gone further than any I'd ever seen James undertake. I suspected that a blood sample taken now would match hers kept on file by the government. Hi, Gertie, she said softly with a smile. Been a long time. This was the part of James' power that scared me. Every once in a while, when a personality took over, they had knowledge that time had passed. They knew they had been dead, and they knew that they had been somewhere. Hi, Jesse, I whispered. You know? Yes, I don't know how it happened. But I was dead, and I was there. I was in... No one who came back could tell us where they were, 
Some block kept them from revealing details. Most seemed to have pleasant experiences, but not all. I knew, I knew you would be there. I can't say what it's like, you know how it goes. But it was nice, yet so empty. You were not there. This was true, of course, because at that moment I was breathing. I'd stay that way forever. My powers were quirky. First, I have the ability to quickly heal from wounds. Not as fast as the ferret. You could chop off one of his hands and he could grab it the new hand before it hit the ground. But I healed quickly and well. A broken arm was a day's inconvenience to me. Anything less than a mortal wound was, at the most, a day to call in sick. I can die, but death does not stay with me. I only know darkness between when my heart stops and when my eyes open the next morning. And that is my second power. If I die, no matter where or when, I always wake up the next morning in whichever bed I currently call my own. Finally, when I find myself awake, I'm always the same fucking body I had when I was 22. I age at a normal pace, but even if I live to be 110 and die with half a lung and two brain cells to rub together, I'll wake up the next morning full of the life and vigor of the young. I would have been there. I tried. After a thousand of years, one get used to saying goodbye. Everyone but a few of us die. It may be the reason I like my job. Tired of goodbyes, I made friends, but they were a surface level. No matter how much I cared for them, I knew I'd, sooner or later I'd be standing at the side of their grave or whatever funeral rite is popular at the time. Without that close connection, it makes it easy for me to think of ways to disable, to kill if needed, my friends. I have been through it over and over, but with Jesse, it was supposed to be an end. No more goodbyes. After her death, I had gone two months never living long enough to see the sunset, and each morning I woke up alone in bed. I'm back now. Don't worry, I won't leave again, she smiled. Jesse, immortal, able to move objects of her mind, fly, of course, and possessing the strongest self flow I have ever met. She was back. I reached over and leaned in. Even though five minutes ago this had been James, Cricket, Wall, Comp, Jackhammer, and Slipster, she smelled like Jessie. I gave in just for a moment. This could be permanent. Her powers would come with the body, and unless we met whatever it had been out in space, we could have eternity together. Longer with alternative universes and tribe travel. I deserved this. I wanted this. But I could see on my mind James's face. I had no desire for men, but knew what a handsome man was. James wasn't handsome. He was average, or slightly below average. He had a terrible sense of humor, and he was mortal. In 50 to 70 years, Barring superhero intervention, he would be gone. Jessie was beauty beyond anything I knew. I knew she thought the same of me. She was intelligent, and she'd be here forever with me. I knew what was right, and I knew what I wanted. You cannot stay. I looked down when I said this, but still I knew her eyes would show pain and a hit of material. But love, I'm here. I could stay. If I go, you will never come to see me. I know. Fuck, I know. But we had our time, Jesse. Two hundred years together. Two hundred and seven. Jesse always remembered this anniversaries, even when I was too busy to keep it in mind. James was our friend. You know him. He's still in there, and he will stay in there trapped. He will... Also, never move on. He will just have to watch every day, every minute. You know how much he feared that. You remember that night after Douglas left, how he wept on our couch all night, relating the terror and the pain he went through. You cannot do that to him. 
I cannot, and I know we will not. I know, I know, damn it. Why do you always have to do the right thing? Because if I did not, you would. And then not let me forget the time I was wrong. <laughs> she laughed and gave Fred a little glance over my shoulder. I heard him click his iPhone into the rarely used bar sound system. Time stands still, beauty and all she does. A Thousand Years by Christina Perry. A recent song, but one we both embraced, came out of the speakers. She took a deep breath and stood up. I followed suit, and we walked into the middle of the bar. Everyone in the room stepped back to give us space, and we danced. Her arms wrapped around me as only she knew how to do. My head was on her shoulder, smelling that smell that was Jessie. We used the same shampoo, the same soap, the same deodorant, but somehow she always smelled better, and it was a smell I knew I would remember forever. The music continued, and we slowly moved across the room. No real steps, more of a slow, long embrace. It was what I wanted, it was what I missed, and it was what I would never have again. I'll love you for a thousand years. The song finished. My eyes were filled with tears. I was numb. Jesse? I asked. No. Just James, he croaked. <laughs>